Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before I begin, I want to say thank you to Francis Helbling, who is the newest patron of the show. I really appreciate all my patrons, and you can be a patron for as little as $3 a month. All you gotta do is go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. There's various tiers and you get everything from shoutouts at the end of every episode, monthly shoutouts on my social media, shirts, early YouTube videos, early podcast episodes, and much more. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. Don't forget, I have two other podcasts out there, Pucks and Cups and From John to Justin, available on all podcast platforms. Today I'm looking at the history of Swift Current. This one's a special one for me because I used to live in Gull Lake, Saskatchewan, which is about 50 kilometers away from Swift Current, and I've been to Swift Current many times. But I still learned many new things researching this episode. And as usual, when I'm looking at the history of a community, I won't be going through a chronological look, but rather looking at the various interesting aspects of the community. So, let's begin. Indigenous History Prior to the arrival of Europeans, the indigenous, most notably the Cree and the Blackfoot, lived in the area of Swift Current, a creek they knew well. The indigenous would camp on the shores of the creek for centuries, and it is from the indigenous that we get the name of the community. The Cree called the creek Kisakatsiwan, which means it flows swiftly. The indigenous would travel along the creek in search of wild game, finding elk, moose, bison, deer, pronghorns, cougars, and even bears in abundance. Fish and birds were also found in high numbers along the creek. And thanks to the fact that building materials, firewood, root berries, and wild game, the future area of Swift Current was a popular place to camp. Today, Swift Current sits on Treaty 4 land. And as I will get to later in this episode, Indigenous habitation in the Swift Current area dates back as much as 6,000 years. Founding of the Community In the early 1800s, fur traders began to move through the area, and they would name the area Rivière au Courant, or River of the Current. Henri Julien, who came west with the Northwest Mounted Police in 1874, called it Du Courant, while Commissioner George French named it Strong Current Creek in his diary. As time went on, the name became Swift Current. Swift Current, the community, was settled in 1883 when the Canadian Pacific Railway surveyed a line through and built the track. The early economy of Swift Current was focused on the railroad for the most part, with workers working in the new railway buildings. There was also a growing ranching industry thanks to the nearby 76 Ranch, which eventually became 10 ranches that raised sheep and cattle and stretched from Calgary to Swift Current. At Swift Current, sheep were the most common livestock to be transported. On the present site of the kinetic grounds in Swift Current, there was once 20,000 sheep who were herded by John Omen, a shepherd from Scotland. In 1885, Swift Current became an important military base and troop mustering area for the Canadian troops and Northwest Mounted Police during the Northwest Resistance. The first business was opened by Fraser Timms, who operated a store. W.H. Field would be the first doctor for the area, arriving in 1903, but the first hospital would not come along for another nine years. The community would slowly grow, becoming a village on February 4, 1904, and then a town on March 15, 1907. That year, the community had a population of 550 people. Seven years later, on January 15, 1914, Swift Current became a city. Today, the community is a thriving center and the biggest community between Medicine Hat and Moose Jaw. Agriculture and oil are the biggest industries, with 4,000 wells completed in the area. Swift Current sits atop the Shonovan Formation, which has yielded 500 million barrels in total production. And today, Swift Current has a population of 17,000 people, making it the fifth largest city in Saskatchewan. The 
the Swift Current Creek Petroglyph Boulder. The value of petroglyphs can't be understated. They serve as a reminder of the past and a message from the past. And Swift Current is lucky enough to have petroglyphs nearby to it, offering an amazing opportunity to see something from the distant past. Located on the upper slope of the Swift Current Creek Valley east of Swift Current, the 16-hectare provincial site features a large limestone boulder that has petroglyphs from before contact with Europeans. The petroglyphs detail bison figures, hoof prints, and geometric shapes. Around the site, pre-contact artifacts and other paintings of mythological animal figures were also found, and there are remains of bone and charcoal at the site as well. It is believed that the boulder's petroglyphs date back at least 1,200 years, and it's one of the best preserved petroglyph sites in all of Saskatchewan. The petroglyphs also used a rarely seen black pigment, making this a very unique site in all of Canada. The site itself also has a significant cultural and spiritual value for the indigenous of the area. The bison show the animals that once roamed throughout the area, and the boulder and its petroglyphs commemorate the sacred relationship that existed between the bison and the indigenous people. Many indigenous view the boulder as a link to their past and a symbol of their cultural identity. For archaeologists, the site is a high scientific and educational value because it is a pre-contact indigenous array of symbols, ceremonies, and artistic expression. The valley and its natural grassland setting also give an unobstructed view of the area and it gives a sense of what the site looked like when the petroglyphs were first being carved. Due to its historic and cultural importance, the site was listed as a provincial heritage site on August 27, 1990. The Swift Current Museum The museum in Swift Current, located at the center of the community, is excellent for a community the size of Swift Current. It is also one of the oldest, dating back to 1937 when the museum began to collect artifacts. The permanent gallery features historic and contemporary items that examine the relationship of humans and the environment in southwest Saskatchewan. And the gallery is self-guided, but tours are available if requested. The temporary exhibit gallery changes several times a year, featuring everything from dinosaur bones found in the area, to the history of the indigenous, to notable residents who have lived in the area over the course of the last 125 years. One of the favorite pieces for many residents at the museum is the 72 million year old Tylosaur that is on display. Other items you can find in the museum include taxidermy of animals such as bison, burrowing animals and various birds. There are also recreations of portions of the history of the community. The Saskatchewan Hockey Hall of Fame If you love hockey, and I do, then check out the Ted Knight Saskatchewan Hockey Hall of Fame, located at the Innovation Credit Union Iplex, where the WHL Swift Current Broncos play. As for Ted Knight, he was a member of the 1958-59 Memorial Cup winning team with the Winnipeg Braves, and would go on to found several car dealerships in Saskatchewan. Thanks to a $500,000 donation from the Knight family, the facility is named in his honour. Within the Hockey Hall of Fame, you can find memorabilia from the players who have made their mark in the NHL and were born in or grew up in Saskatchewan. Players inducted into the Hall of Fame include Kelly Bookberger, Keith Magnuson, Haley Wickenheiser, Bob Bourne, Wendell Clark, Tiger Williams, Emil Francis, Bernie Federko, Clark Gillies, Eddie Shore, Sid Abel, Johnny Bauer, Glenn Hall, Brian Trottier, Fred Sasakamus, and of course, Mr. Hockey, Gordy Howe. The Mennonite Heritage Village Just like Steinbach, which I covered earlier this week, Swift Current also has a Mennonite heritage village, which depicts the lifestyle and customs of homestead settlers who helped form the early history of the community. Within the village you will find a church and garden and an original homestead, and the buildings contain authentic artifacts and antiques, and tours can be booked throughout the grounds. The village is classified as a living museum, which makes it an even better experience for anyone who loves history. The village was founded in 1992 and showcases the life of the Mennonites from the 1880s to the 1920s. 
The homestead portion of the village features a house barn that serves as a good example of a typical home in a rural village. The siding, shingles, shutters, and windows have all been restored to be as original as possible. And the house came from Rhineland near Swift Current and was built in 1915 and moved into Swift Current in 1992. The Summerfield Church was built in 1914 and has gone through several renovations over the course of its life. It is similar to many European churches that date back to the 1500s. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I've spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms, and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. The Lyric Theatre Grand theatres are a thing of the past, but one still remains in swift current, and it's still used for mostly its original purpose. The Lyric Theatre was designed by local resident C.A. Bloom, and construction was completed in 1912 at a cost of $50,000, or $1.5 million today. The theatre was influenced by the neoclassical style, common for early theatres in the 20th century. Another great feature of the building is that there is ghost advertising signage on the side elevations, giving a glimpse into the long-gone past. The theatre was built as a vaudeville theatre with seating for 400 patrons, and it would operate as that for a few years, but from 1918 to 1981 it was a movie theatre. At the same time it hosted lectures, balls, church services, pet shows, dance classes and more. It even served as isolation quarters during the Spanish flu in 1918. In the basement there was once a bowling alley and pool room, while the second floor served as apartments for employees. Today, the second story is still the location of apartments, and the theatre is one of the few buildings from the pre-First World War era of Swift Current to still survive in the downtown core. In 1981, the theatre was converted into a nightclub, and in 2005 it became a performing arts cultural centre. On January 22, 2007, the theatre was named a municipal heritage property. The CPR Dam Built in 1888, the CPR Dam runs 139 metres to create an earth-filled wooden plank spillway. The dam had been built by the Canadian Pacific Railway to create a reservoir to provide water for the steam locomotives that travelled along the main line of the railroad. Using the power of the Swift Current Creek, water was pumped to the roundhouse and water tank near the station. Eventually, the dam was rebuilt to have a concrete crest, wings and walls, along with the aforementioned wood plank spillway over the earth-filled construction. Located in Riverside Park, it is a municipal heritage property as of May 6, 1985. The Swift Current Railway Station Swift Current was an important getting-off point for soldiers, new settlers, and just people looking to start a new life in the community. The point where many were first introduced to the area was the station, and Swift Current still has this train station, something that tends to be rare these days. Made up of three buildings, the first building is a one-story passenger ticket sales office and waiting room that was built in 1907 and extended in 1923. The second building is a two-room dining room and telegraph building that was built between 1908 and 1909 and then extended in 1957. 
and the third building is a one-story express building built in 1912. Built of local red brick, the station's continued expansion over the course of 1907 to 1912 showed the growing importance of swift current in the southwest area, which continues to this day. All three buildings contain their original integrity internally and are on their original locations. The site also includes the railroad tracks that are now used for freight rather than passenger service. On September 1, 1991, the federal government recognized the site as a Heritage Railway Station under the Heritage Railway Stations Protection Act. The Gray Burial Site Located on a farm northwest of Swift Current, there is an ancient human burial site located in a small area on a hillside. This is a very rare example of an indigenous burial ground on the Canadian prairies, and most estimates put it around 3000 BC, making it one of the oldest of these sites ever found in Canada. In fact, it's older than the pyramids and as old as Stonehenge. The site is associated with the hunter-gatherer group whose members hunted bison herds as well as other mammals and birds in the area. The site was apparently used over an extended period, showing that the indigenous returned to it on a regular basis over the years and possibly centuries. There are roughly 87 burials containing 154 individuals at least. The burials also show a remarkable degree of variation in burial techniques. And on November 15, 1973, the site was named a National Historic Site of Canada. The Battleford Trail Ruts Heritage Site Swift Current has one of the most unique historical sites I've ever seen. The Battleford Trail Wheel Rut area consists of one city lot in the city inside a fenced enclosure and this enclosure features cart and wagon ruts that are the remnants of this historic trail that ran towards Battleford, which for a time was the capital of the Northwest Territories. The site serves as a relic of the link between the two communities that was so important during the late 19th century. The trail was likely first created by the indigenous prior to the arrival of Europeans, and the peak use of the trail was from 1883 to 1890, and during the Northwest Resistance, the trail was an important route taken by Colonel William Otter and his troops to travel from Swift Current to Battleford. The trail was used heavily by people to move themselves, freight, and more, but when the rail line was built through Saskatoon in 1890, the trail began to see its importance decline, but there is evidence that it was still used for local travel as late as 1925. On October 18, 1982, the site was named a Municipal Heritage Property. Notable Residents Patrick Marlowe was born in Swift Current on September 15, 1975 and is arguably the most famous person to come from the community. Raised in the nearby community of Aneroid, Marlowe was drafted second overall in 1997 by the San Jose Sharks and at the time of this episode, 2021, was still playing in the NHL. On January 11, 2020, he played his 1700th game, one of only five to reach that mark. And while Marlowe has won two gold medals with Canada in 2010 and 2014 and been nominated for the Lady Bing twice, he currently holds the record for playing the most NHL games without winning the Stanley Cup. If he remains healthy for the rest of the season, Marlowe will pass Gordie Howe for the most games all time among NHL players and is likely going to make it into the Hockey Hall of Fame. As of 2019-20, he has 1,188 points in 1,723 games. Let's go to PA. Regular season NHL game, surpassing Hockey Hall of Famer Mark Messier for second place on the all-time NHL games playlist. Congratulations to Patrick Marlowe. And there you have it. Now that he's played a shift, it's official. Brad Wall was born in Swift Current on November 24, 1965, and was first elected to the Legislative Assembly of Saskatchewan for Swift Current in 1999. He would be re-elected in 2003, 2007, 2011, and 2016. 
In 2004, he became the leader of the opposition when he was chosen as the leader of the Saskatchewan party. And in 2007, he led the party to a majority government and then to another one in 2011 when his party claimed the largest popular vote share in Saskatchewan history, winning 49 of 58 seats. Saskatchewan is ushering in a new era tonight, electing the right-of-centre Saskatchewan party, ending 16 years of NDP government. Going into this election, Saskatchewan was in good shape with a strong economy. So tonight's vote may leave many in the rest of Canada wondering why the change. The CBC's Melissa Fung has been watching the returns tonight. Melissa. Peter, the people of Saskatchewan voted for change tonight. They've handed the Saskatchewan party a majority government with more than 50% of the popular vote. And after 16 years of NDP rule, this is a tough loss for Premier Lorne Calvert. Well, we know people in Saskatchewan want to change. Change after 16 years is what the fresh-faced leader of the Saskatchewan party campaigned on. <laughs> How are you doing? After coming close in the last two elections, the party, led by 42-year-old Brad Wall, has its best chance of winning the legislature since it was formed 10 years ago, out of the remnants of the scandal-plagued conservatives of the 1980s. <laughs> Today, the Saskatchewan party has moved more to the center, appealing in this campaign to young urban families. It would be a, a benefit of $150 per child. Wooing them with incentives like a credit for families with children enrolled in sports and arts, and small tax breaks like eliminating the PST on used cars. Historically, the voters in Saskatchewan had been more willing to vote for change when things are good, more willing to hand a new government an already strong economy. They did it with Ross Thatcher's Liberals in the 60s, Grant Devine's Conservatives in the 80s, and tonight they're doing it again with Brad Wall and the Saskatchewan party. Often polled as the most popular Premier in Canada, he is credited with raising the profile of Saskatchewan on the national stage, while also seeing the economy boom thanks to high oil prices. In 2014, when prices started to slide, Wall saw his popularity decline as well, and he would resign as the Premier of Saskatchewan in 2018. He is the fourth longest tenured Premier in the history of Saskatchewan. He's also the father of Coulter Wall, who is a rising star in the country music world, reaching number eight on the U.S. country charts with his album Western Swing and Waltzes and Other Punchy Songs in 2020. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Swift Current. If you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can reach me through email at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to canadaehx.com. And don't forget you can support the podcast through Patreon. There are multiple tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month just like all of these wonderful patrons have, and I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Francis Helbling, Randy McCallum, Diane Wade, Laurie-Ann Kirby, Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. If you want... You can find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash CanadianHistoryX. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-E-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram. Just go to Bairdo37. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.